You may have just heard a prompt and then you can hit continue. Um, if for whatever reason you lose connection to this event, you can go on MAPC's Facebook page or YouTube page and we will be live streaming there. Um, and then Saliki, if you can hit the next slide. Um, just to let you know today's agenda before I turn it over, we'll have some opening remarks, presentation from Saliki, our panel discussion, um, and then we'll be closing. Um, and that is, that is all the housekeeping I'm gonna do. And now to really start the event, uh, I would like to welcome Mark Drayson, Executive Director of the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Emily. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I'm so thankful that so, much, so many people, over 100 people have joined us so far. And we can see the numbers continuing to rise even as, as the project is beginning, as the, the Zoom meeting is beginning here. Uh, one of MAPC's responsibilities uh, under statute as the Regional Planning Agency for Greater Boston is to develop from time to time a regional plan for the communities in, in our region. And uh, we do this about once every 10 years. Our current plan is called Metro Future. And as so many of you know, because you've been participating, the regional plan we are working on now and which we hope to finish in 2021 is called Metro Common 2050. And it will look ahead to both the years 2030 and 2050 with a series of goals and objectives, policy recommendations to get us there, and indicators to measure progress. In both Metro Future and Metro Common, equity has been a very important part of both of those efforts. And there is no time in our country, I think, when the focus on equity is, is greater than it is currently. Uh, most of the people participating in this call probably are either uh, representing municipal government or they are associated or affiliated with municipal government in one way or another. And I think one of the important things for us to admit, to deal with, to live with, to kind of keep in our heads and our hearts is that although there are many vectors for racism and exclusion in America, historically local government has often been one of those. And for those of you who have read The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein or so many other important works, we know that very often uh, the, the factors that resulted in exclusion and segregation and racism were not things that just happened. They were intentional and driven accomplishments. The pattern of settlement that we see today, where people are, how much they have in the world, what they do, what their prospects are, they were molded by many of the actions that were taken by government agencies. And one of our commitments at MAPC, and I know the commitment of many of our cities and towns, is to try and deal with that and address it and turn it around it will not happen in one day or one month or one year. It doesn't require only one or two actions to fix. It's a major systemic series of issues that need to be dealt with kind of every day when we wake up and figure out what we're gonna do during the day. Uh, so well before the current crisis, after the murder of George Floyd and others, well before that time, MAPC decided that we were going to do an analysis of employment in the municipal field. And that we were going to do so in a somewhat different way from what has been done in the past using census data. And we began that work and evaluated the diversity of employment across several different chapters, several different factors uh, throughout our region and were prepared to release it in March. Well, something else happened in March, as you all know. And um, we were unable to do so at that time. But um, with current changes and, and somewhat lessening of the pandemic here in greater Boston, at least here, not everywhere in America, obviously, not everywhere in the world, we felt it was very, very important to once again take this issue up and make a presentation on the work that we had done and figure out ways to factor it into <clears throat> the policy recommendations in Metro Common. Uh, and we're very pleased to have with us Saliki Flinge, Dr. Saliki Flinge, who was until recently a member of the MAPC staff before he moved on to other wonderful challenges in New York City, and uh, particularly focused on the criminal justice field. And he has been our lead researcher and is going to present on the report. Uh, and then we're going to have the panelists who are going to respond to it, bring in their own perspectives, and we'll have plenty of opportunity for Q&A and comments from the floor, so to speak. One thing I want to mention, however, 
is that MAPC, along with the Federal Reserve Bank and GARE, the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, which is represented here today by Gordon Goodwin, one of our panelists, is to develop a program we call uh, REMAP, Racial Equity Municipal Action Program, uh, which will be a competitive program. We will bring communities into that program for an annual, a year-long period of deep training, assessment, and self-reflection as well as the development of an action plan and taking specific action steps to confront racism uh, and inequity in local communities. That program is going to begin uh, with an application that will go out on notification for a grant opportunity at the end of the month. And I hope that many of you, perhaps inspired uh, either by today's presentation or by what's going on in the world and in your communities, will apply and participate in what I think is going to be a wonderful opportunity to not only learn what goes on, but to take steps to deal with some of the challenges and crises we face. So with that, uh, I am going to um, proudly turn it over to Saliki. Sorry, I wanna do one more thing. I wanna thank so many members of my staff, I can't name them all, but I know Tim and Jesse, Tim Reardon, Jesse Partridge Guerrero from Data Services, Emily Torres Cullinane, Sasha Perotti, Amanda Linehan, Elise Harmon are all involved. My own deputy director, Rebecca Davis, Mark Fine, the director of municipal collaboration. I'm probably leaving people out, but backing Saliki up, there was a whole raft of folks at MAPC who worked to make sure this report would happen and it was as good as it could possibly be uh, and that it is presented in an impactful way uh, through today's event. So a big thank you and congratulations to all of them who worked so hard to get to this morning. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Flinge. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark, for that introduction. Uh, and as Mark so wonderfully set up, uh, this work really couldn't be more timely. And so I'm really looking forward to the conversation and the action this research may spark. Uh, so I just want to secondly thank, uh, once again, Tim Rita and Mark Fine and Jesse Parger Guerrero for their contributions and guidance to this work, as well as all the municipal stakeholders that we were able to communicate with um, and have really helpful conversations with during the formation of this research. So Mark framed this research up really well. Um, so I'll actually kind of just get right into it. Uh, during this presentation, I'll begin with some guiding motivations about uh, the research and a brief overview of our research approach. And then I'll get into our key findings before wrapping up uh, by outlining some considerations for recruitment policy and best practices that we were able to, to understand. So for many residents, uh, this character of Massachusetts communities is defined by the people who work in city and town government. And their image of municipal government uh, can be found, for, found in their elected officials, but also in their school teachers their librarians, their tax assessors, police, police officers, and many other government workers. Uh, there's both a visible government worker presence and also people behind the scenes who are also helping the municipality's physical and fiscal landscape. And ultimately, uh, government is made of people. And so the people in the municipal government have just as much influence as the official policies and regulations in the community. Because of this, a municipal government should be welcoming, representative, and responsive to all of its constituents. But as Mark has alluded to, this has not always been the case. We are well aware of many instances where government policies have had particularly negative outcomes on marginalized communities. From stop and frisk policing, disproportionately targeting black and brown residents, to policies that target homeless people instead of homelessness, uh, to local zoning laws and housing segregation that create and maintain segregation, our country, our state, and our cities and towns have seen and often contributed to systemic oppression, discriminatory policies, and biased attitudes that simply don't make uh, a sense of community and belonging for everyone. And so it's important to think about who implements the policies that help dictate how we live with one another. Because cities and towns uh, and their governments are made up of people, and these people carry out policies, develop practices, engage with communities and provide economic opportunities, it's crucial to ask, particularly during this national and global reckoning of racial injustice, who works in our local governments? Who are the people working in our city halls and town halls, our schools, our police stations, and working on public works projects? 
And do they reflect the diversity of the communities that they serve or the region as a whole? So these are the primary questions guiding this research. And I mentioned this historic reckoning of national and, and global racial injustice. Uh, and few people have words more responsive to this moment than political activist and scholar Angela Davis. And she's had some thoughts on diversity. So recently, Professor Davis said, diversity is a corporate strategy. It's a difference that doesn't make a difference. Now, if this was the final word, we could just pack up this event right now, call it a day, um, but it's not. She had more to say. Uh, she said uh, the following, I suggest diversity without structural transformation simply brings those who have been previously excluded into a system as racist and misogynist as it was before. So in other words, if diversity is the only thing a workplace is pursuing, then it's likely employees that it's trying to recruit and retain. Davis recognizes what everyone here probably does as well, that diversity may be a valiant goal, but can also easily become just a buzzword, some star for many well-intentioned workplaces to want to feel like they're doing the right thing. But Professor Davis asked us to honest with why we want to diversify. Is it because it's the quote unquote good thing to do? Or is it because we truly want to create more equitable, just working environments and governments where everyone feels truly welcomed as employees and in the community and are truly represented by their government? So I wanted to add a couple of other uh, guiding motivations. Um, for one, how do we make our municipal workforces explicitly anti-racist and anti-sexist to make them welcoming environments for everyone? And to put this another way, uh, how do we begin to structurally transform our institutions all the way from the organizational structure, practices, policies, ways of growth and accountability, et cetera, um, in order to truly make them more just and equitable? So again, diversity is necessary, but it's also insufficient to create the truly representative, dynamic, just and equitable government for its employees and for its constituents. So why should municipal leaders and stakeholders be concerned with their demographics of their municipal workforces? So as I said before, the character, practices, and policies of municipal governments are intertwined with the people they employ. And there are many reasons to name, but uh, three that come to mind are the diversity's ability to increase the range of perspectives, experience, and skills in the municipal workforce. Uh, it can lead to greater innovation. It can lead to blind spots being accounted for. It can lead to the sharing of institutional knowledge, and it can help foster institutional change. Um, it can also lead to stronger policies and program outcomes through addressing those blind spots and hopefully bringing other community members into the fold, particularly marginalized communities who may not have are seen in government spaces before. And through this, it can lead to better representation and path for people who enter municipal government. So, to help answer the questions of how our, is our region different, uh, MAPC examined the demographics of the Metro Boston municipal workforce, the main is. Uh, first, we looked at the American Community Survey, the US Census Bureau, and looked at self-reported demographic and occupational information. Uh, we also looked at uh, data sets from the US uh, Justice Bureau of Statistics, or Bureau of Justice Statistics, um, which samples law enforcement agencies throughout uh, the country. And we were able to find a number of agencies in the region who submitted race, and gender graphics on their police departments to get a finer look at how police departments are constructed uh, demographically. And then where publicly available, we also use uh, municipal workforce demographic data um, for individuals throughout the region. Well, Boston and Cambridge have an interactive publicly available dashboard on municipal workforce demographics. And so we were able to see there whether uh, certain municipalities kind of followed the pattern of the region generally or had differences that were worth kind of thinking about. And using this data, we looked at age, sex, race and, race and ethnicity, and occupation for the 164 municipalities that make up the Metro Boston region. 
So the data that we had had a few limitations that we felt worth mentioning from the onset. Um, because the information is reported based on a worker's home location and not their place of work, we couldn't quite um, provide worker information for specific municipal governments. Um, and we also acknowledge that this research focuses on the entire region. So there's maybe municipalities that are doing really well on diversity and others who are lagging behind that we weren't able to see um, in, in detail. So this is kind of, again, a regional outlook. Uh, and we can't quite, quite be certain about the demographics of municipal workers who commute in and out of the region as well. But secondly, while this report focuses on age, race, ethnicity, and gender diversity, there are many other areas of representation and identi identity that we could not assess via our data. Um, and there are areas of identity that are in our data that are incomplete. For example, the male gender female binary, male female gender binary present in the census data does not uh, give gender nonconforming um, people and people of many different gender identities space to, to truly represent themselves. Uh, we also couldn't look at class or disability status or educational attainment or any number of areas of marginalization. And so further research is going to be needed to really um, describe this uh, work further. That said, this analysis can provide a really solid foundation for understanding how our local government workers uh, are uh, demographically laid out along many key characteristics. Kali, I'm sorry, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt you. Um, I just noticed that your signal might be a little um, low. Could you take yourself um, maybe off video? And I think that might do it. Yeah, sorry about that. No problem, thank you so much. All right, hopefully this is gonna be better. Um, all right, at a glance, uh, the municipal workforce makes up a sizable portion of the overall labor force in the region. Roughly 7% of the civilian labor force, or 124,000 people, work full time for city and town government. And when we break it down further, we see that most of those workers are education, training, and library workers. So your teachers, your teacher assistants, your librarians. And there's also a sizable chunk that are in protective service, your law enforcement, your fire departments, your security officers, et cetera. Overall, around six occupational groups make up around 80% of the municipal government. So uh, we also recognize that the education workforce had particularly unique demographics. And so there are gonna be times throughout this presentation where we include the educational workforce in our data explicitly and other times where we tease it out and, and look at the workforce absent the educational uh, workforce, and you'll understand why in a bit. So throughout our analysis, we eventually came upon six key findings. Uh, first, the municipal workforce is generally older than a civilian labor force, and it is in great need of younger workers to fill impending workforce gaps. The second, the municipal workforce simply doesn't match the demographics of its constituency, constituents in, in many demographic areas. Third, this is particularly true for younger workers of color who are greatly underrepresented in uh, municipal government. Fourth, uh, disparities are even larger among municipal management. So senior level workers have even greater disparities. Fifth, uh, law enforcement and firefighters are especially unrepresentative of the region with white men making up upwards of 80% of their workforces. And lastly, uh, and this one won't be talked about in this presentation, uh, but it's found in the report, uh, there are significant gaps in younger workers in specialized occupations such as IT and finance. So we first look at the municipal government as a whole, uh, which you can see in dark green, and compared it to age demographics of the region's labor, civilian labor force in light green. And we found a couple of things. First, we found that the municipal workforce is overrepresented in baby boomers and underrepresented and younger workers between 13 and 34 years old. And when we dug a bit deeper, we saw that nearly half of current municipal workers will be past traditional retirement age of 65 years old by age 30. So these age disparities suggest that there's a need to attract younger workers to fill in the ranks of the retiring baby boomers, and that this need may be greater in the public sector than in the private sector. When we broke down the whole workforce by race and ethnicity, here's an example where we looked at uh, the municipal workforce, and then also started to tease out some of the education occupations as well uh, to get a finer look. 
And so the first thing we see in, in light green and in dark and medium green is that uh, the civilian labor force is 74% white, but the municipal workforce is 85% white. So there's a great over-representation of white workers in the civilian labor force, and this comes with an underrepresentation of primarily Hispanic, Latinx, and Asian Pacific Islander workers. And this is the pattern that's pretty persistent in many occupations that we'll see. Um, and we also see that this increases when we look specifically at education occupations in gray, uh, where 89% of workers are white. When we break this down by sex, um, we see that uh, the municipal workforce overall has a greater share of female workers. 55% of the municipal workforce is female compared to 45% male. And when we look at education occupations in gray, that explains a lot of uh, this, uh, this demographic makeup. 76% of education workers are female compared to 24% that are male. And when we look at municipal workers who aren't in the education field, uh, the third bars, we see that 59% uh, of workers that aren't in education are male and 41% are female. And so together, these data show that the demographics of the municipal workforce are generally quite different than those of the civilian labor force across many dimensions. Next, we looked at the representation of people of color and we found that it was particularly true for younger workers. Uh, when we looked at the civilian labor force here in light green, we can see that in younger age cohorts on the left part of the graph, you generally have around 30% of the workforce being people of color. And as you look at older age cohorts, that uh, decreases um, significantly. Um, yet for the municipal workforce, we see that we generally have around 15 to 20% of, of workers across all age cohorts um, being people of color there. So not only are we seeing significantly fewer people of color in the municipal workforce across all age cohorts, but it's particularly pronounced the gap um, between municipal and civilian labor forces in the younger age cohorts. Sorry, one sec. Um, and so, yeah, when we look at this gap, we see that there's a clear need for uh, increased diversity at younger age cohorts. And this gap may show that there's either a recruitment issue or a retention issue, but clearly some sort of issue. Uh, so switching gears a bit, uh, we looked at the municipal management workforce and found that the disparities were even larger by age. Around two thirds of municipal managers um, were before, born between, before, the age, before 1970 or baby boomers and, and older. Uh, suggesting that there's going to be a substantial amount of older managers that will be retiring in the next decade. And their institutional knowledge and skills may go with, with them unless there's substantial workforce development planning. And while the civilian labor force is only around 74% white, when we break down managers by race, we see that in the civilian labor force, and in particular in the municipal workforce, managers are overwhelmingly white. And again, we see this hardest hit in the Asian Pacific Islander workforce where Roughly zero uh, percent of the managers in the municipal workforce are Asian Pacific Islander. Now, one of the most striking overrepresentations that speak to both gender and race are police and fire departments. And so, while the racial breakdown of police officers, for example, shown here, may be roughly on par with the overall percent of white municipal workers, uh, we'd be remiss to suggest that the same issues plaguing like IT workers follow with how we should be approaching the uh, region's police forces. Because police have a unique role in society. They're one of the only occupations that can use violence in the name of government policy. And the last few months of protests and uprisings have shown that this exercise of power has been historically rooted and happens today all along racial lines. Uh, and so we can't avoid talking about that. So it's particularly important to note that in a region that has over a quarter of people of color, the police force is 90% white. Not only that, but 78% of officers are white males. So this racial and gender disparity is extreme and it's only surpassed by firefighters, which we'll get to in a bit. So we looked deeper into specific police departments throughout the region. We're able to look at data on 42 to police departments in the Metro Boston region um, using federal government data. And we found that uh, over nearly a third of police departments have citizens of residents of color, but have no officers of color. 
And so while there may be some variability in how municipalities have diverse police departments, overall the picture is rather poor. And again, when we look at firefighters, the situation is actually worse. We're regionally 87% of firefighters are white and 84% of all of the firefighters are white male. So uh, well, the data that we've shown clearly highlights that there's some particular practices and patterns to municipal hiring and recruitment uh, that we thought we needed to kind of look into. And so uh, there are a variety of policies that make up how governments work and we, we wanted to highlight five in particular. So first, there's some municipalities that restrict hiring based on residency. Uh, there's others that have tenure protections, often for manager, managers that can protect incumbents and make them hard to replace. Uh, there are unions that provide various protections for professions and staff. And then there's collective bargaining agreements that set out certain recruitment parameters and targets for the number of staff that can be employed. And one that came to mind um, and has a particular influence on some factors, or may have a particular influence on some factors, is the civil service, which is a state system that was established to promote merit-based hiring and reduce favoritism. And it's primarily used in three occupational fields, police departments, correctional officers, and fire departments. And those who pass the civil service exam are ranked along many additional criteria, um, namely veteran status, disabled veterans, uh, widows of veterans, um, and then there are other categories that are lower ranked below that. And generally state law stipulates that veteran status is the highest preference category. And if you have someone who's passed the uh, civil service exam and they have veteran status, then they are highly, highly ranked and therefore um, must be hired before others who be maybe lower ranked. Um, and so this policy has been very effective um, in veteran recruitment, especially in public safety. 26% of firefighters and 19% of law enforcement officers are veterans, much higher than the overall labor force. And in recent years, sorry, in recent years, several communities have pulled their public safety departments from the civil service in order to create their own police and fire recruitment uh, processes. And while the reasons for doing so may vary, having more leeway and being able to hire a more diverse group of officers and firefighters has been cited by some communities as a driver for withdrawal from civil service. And why is this important? Um, well, veterans are overwhelmingly white in a region. And so a preference that ranks veterans above all others may favor white applicants and discriminate against applicants of color. And so here we see that 88% of the civilian labor force veterans are white, uh, which is much higher representation than non-veterans in the civilian labor force, where only 74% are white. And so we investigated whether this had an impact on police and fire veterans, and the racial effects were kind of difficult to ascertain. So further research, I think, will be needed to look into this uh, civil service work much more in the future. And so each municipality knows the criteria and policies by which they carry out recruitment and hiring decisions. And that expertise can help municipalities begin addressing the issues and diversity that they may face. But we thought there are very crucial areas to start. Uh, first, there's a great need for accurate municipal level data to assess demographics uh, on local government workers and to track progress towards increased diversity, equity, and justice. And so a crucial first step is for municipalities to survey their employees and compare their age, gender, and racial ethnic demographics to the residents they serve in the region overall. And this will hopefully adhere to some consistent data standards uh, throughout the region that the Commonwealth, working with municipalities, MAPC, and other stakeholders can help establish. Uh, secondly, cities and towns should study and implement practices to attract, retain, and promote workers from underrepresented backgrounds. There's strategies such as internship programs, employment programs that are specialized in pathways for candidates with criminal records, affinity and research groups, targeted professional development, affirmative promotion practices. And then the strategies are endless. And we, we, along with municipal partners, advocacy organizations, and other stakeholders can start conducting this research and really implementing practices that have worked in other areas and be creative and, and try to establish new practices as well. 
Uh, third, cities and towns should really formally adopt the goal of building inclusive work environments um, and embedding inclusion into hiring. And they should measure progress along this line, um, particularly in the applicant pool, retention and advancement, wage equity, and workplace satisfaction. And lastly, the Commonwealth should launch an initiative to assess more thoroughly the effectiveness of the civil service system and other hiring criteria, such as residency requirements, uh, on municipal hiring and staff diversity. And MAPC can support this effort by helping municipalities uh, procure human resource software and services to provide greater transparency in the hiring management and promotion process. So while there's a need for additional research to understand some of the remaining questions at hand, that should be no excuse for, for municipal leaders, advocacy orgs, residents, and other stakeholders to delay the hard but necessary work of building more just, equitable, and representative municipal workforces in Metro Boston. And that concludes the presentation. So thank you and open to take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Saliki. Um, so we have a comment from Nicole. Nicole, um, we're gonna unmute you if you could just add your comment um, that you posted and then we can go from there. Thank you, Saliki. Thanks, Nicole. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, so I just made the comment about um, in my circle of friends, I as a black woman and other black people and other friends of color, we want to be in positions where we are managers, but in, we have the skills, but we're not given the opportunity to do so. So it leaves us in the position of staying in a job where we have no room for growth or leaving the employer. So how do, how do we have these conversations and get employers to really look at their talent pool and really create opportunities for growth for people so that they don't have to leave to go to other jobs? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think many of our other panels will have some really great answers, but the ones that come to mind for me are, are really having intentional strategies from HR up to leadership of, of understanding how their leadership is structured, for one, and for two, building pathways for, uh, for mentorship uh, and for, for promotion. I mean, I think ultimately what it comes down to is uh, the decision of of uh, leaders to create a culture in their agency where senior level managers can and should be populated by people of color. Um, and, and that's often not the case. And so I think having mentorship uh, programs to kind of guide people through processes and when they have the skills to go up to the next level, actually rewarding that work intentionally and, exp and explicitly is a simple way to start. Um, and it's honestly how recruitment, I mean, how promotion is done, but it's done perhaps selectively and it should not be done selectively. Thank you, um, thank you for that. And I just wanted to ask, um, is there any other questions uh, that people have on the research that was presented, even if it's clarifying questions? Um, we wanted to take a few. If you could put your questions in the chat and then we'll call on you. In the meantime, I think Joy, you had a comment. Um, I think we're gonna unmute you so you can add your comment. Joy, are you with us? Yes, ma'am. All right, I think you had a comment and I just wanted to give you the opportunity to, to share it. You mean the comment about baby boomers? Yes. Yeah, so I'm a baby boomer. Um, I am, I'll be 66 this month. I do plan on working six more years um, for personal reasons, but I think that a lot of folks of my age, just the whole diversity discussion is something that many folks of my age just, you know, uh, it's a bit overwhelming for them. Um, and so it's possible, and uh, this, this is um, just a thought, that as uh, folks of my age begin to retire, as you pointed out in the next 10 years, uh, that some of those poor attitudes about diversity will retire with them. But we can't just wait for that. We need to be proactive. We need to reach out and figure out a way to 
uh, be inclusive and to be very thoughtful about that inclusivity because you know I remember that when I applied for college back as a, uh, a high school uh, senior I was actually told in several college ad admission interviews that they couldn't accept me into their college because their quota for people of my color uh, which is white uh, were full and they had to take um, you know, other people that didn't fit into that quota. So we don't want to have any reverse uh, discrimination going on by saying we only want to bring up people of color, but we have to be really inclusive to be sure that we've fully included not only people of color, but of all kinds of ethnic um, diversity in just being, as you pointed out, welcoming and very inclusive to anyone who's interested in figuring out how this system should work and making all those intrinsic changes in the system itself so that ultimately we come out with something that you know is um is good for all of us for all of us you know as far as the municipalities i work for state government um uh, you know so i just i just i guess want to be encouraging and say there are people obviously very obviously who are working really hard on this and i think that in these times I think people more and more are getting onto this um, this platform where they can they realize they can't stay the same as they've been and so that was really where that was coming from sure. uh, thank you for that comment I, I think um, some of the points you brought up are uh, really important in particular I think the idea that um, we, we shouldn't be kind of relaxed about this assumption that as um, older workers retire that um, issues with diversity will uh, go along with them. I think we've seen a lot of situations where institutions keep certain cultures and practices alive regardless of who enters them. And it takes, as you said, this intentionality of really wanting to change how a culture of an institution exists, or maybe just change the institution itself, um, in order for those changes and attitudes to really hold stain sustainably. Um, and so it, we can't simply rely on uh, the old guard of thinking with regards to diversity, um, leaving the workforce in a new regard, suddenly having better attitudes. I think we really have to be intentional about what attitudes and culture, cultural ideas we want to have in our offices and really doubling down on inclusion and really doubling down on giving opportunities and really doubling down on eliminating barriers. Because I think um, with regards to uh, recruitment and retention of, of marginalized communities, uh, they're typically entering systems that have historically not included them. And so including them shouldn't be felt as uh, a taking away the spots of, of white workers, but it really should be seen as like giving proper opportunity. And I think having that message hammered down in a cultural way, which is a real important message, I think is one of the ways that we can continue this work of increasing diversity in a truly sustainable way. Great. Thank you, Saliki. We're just going to take one more question and then we'll move on to the panelist discussion. So Christine Ko, can you please ask your question? Um, thank you so much for this opportunity and for the presentation. Um, you mentioned that Boston and Cambridge have employee diversity data on their open data portals. And I was wondering if um, a city was interested in starting to report this, if there are specific data standards or examples you can point us to to start um, planning how we would do this on our side. So um, at the current moment, my understanding is that there are not state level data standards that every municipality must adhere to in order to allow data to be kind of comparable across municipalities. With Boston and Cambridge, they use a, their particular systems and uh, that does not necessarily mean that those systems are the ones that every other municipality may use internally or in their own Kind of demographic analyses. So we're, we would love to have people develop that standard um, collectively so that we can all come to an understanding of kind of what pieces of information we do find incredibly important to, to track. Um, so I don't know if um, 
there's anyone, uh, either Jesse or, or Tim and the data team would like to add on to that? Uh, I think they did in the chat a little bit. So okay, uh, we, I think we can, we have some more questions coming in and I think we're gonna hold those for the panelists. Um, so without further ado, Mayor Spicer um, from the city of Framingham. Good morning, all, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. And uh, Dr. Uh, Flinge, thank you so much for that excellent research report. You know, one, one of the things that I, I, I gathered from your work is um, looking at it, first of all, it confirmed a number of things that, you know, I, I had an inkling of an idea about our metro um, communities, but it also solidified um, some of the concerns I had. Uh, particularly in municipal government, uh, uh, one, uh, hiring uh, and retaining uh, our younger workforce, and then also not only just uh, uh, mentoring uh, our younger workforce into positions of leadership, but sponsoring them as well. And that's a whole other notion of a conversation around how do you uh, mentor and sponsor uh, a younger workforce. And as it relates to people of color, it comes back to the, the notion of looking at our communities and how do they reflect um, the diversity uh, within the municipal government. And, you know, and I, when I first became mayor in uh, 2018, uh, being the first mayor of the city of Framingham, um, that was a question I had immediately was what did the municipal workforce look like? Did it reflect the city of Framingham? And uh, uh, Framingham is approximately 30% uh, people of color that live in Framingham. And so uh, doing an analysis of our uh, workforce, uh, you know, it, it was very uh, stark and startling that approximately 91% of the people that worked in city government were white. And uh, so it certainly did not reflect our community. And, uh, and similar to uh, uh, Dr. Um, Saliki's uh, Finge's uh, work is that um, overwhelmingly uh, uh, female, uh, the, the demographics of females were, were prevalent, but also um, the age range. And being one of those people that are, is in the baby boomer range myself, um, I also looked at that data to find out that um, a, a good, a roughly about 45% um, about of the people in government uh, were in that baby boomer range. So, you know, we, we have multiple things happening. First of all, diversifying our workforce and what does that mean? And, and for me, that is at least, a, you know, what I would consider a, a target floor is that the demographics of the workforce uh, reflect the community that you are in. And, uh, and when it doesn't, it is at a disadvantage as, as was clearly pointed out in some of the research in terms of innovation, in terms of ideas. And um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that, um, my office is comprised of, of predominantly Generation X and Y, uh, but uh, which I absolutely love. And uh, but there are also some baby boomers, and and I've started to build that capacity to expand in terms of linguistic diversity, cultural diversity, and some of those strategies that you have to put in place. And what are those strategies that you need to put in place? Uh, first and foremost, I think you have to be intentional extremely intentional about the direction you're moving in. And uh, from the onset, uh, you know, even with the advertisement of uh, positions within city government, they were sent out in multiple languages. And that was done intentionally to try to attract uh, a, a cross representation of our linguistic diversity within our community, as well as cultural diversity. So those are the those are the starting points of where we are, and 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 with the ultimate hope too. The the one thing that I can honestly say, given uh, this pandemic, we have uh, really adjusted, had to adjust ourselves and how we work. And and many of us have been working remotely. Um, I definitely think that uh, there is a. Uh, an opportunity to reframe and reshape how we conduct uh, municipal government. I also see it as an opportunity to attract and retain a younger workforce because that is clearly something uh, in my prior life before becoming mayor, I was vice president of Museum of Science in Boston. 
and uh, and our workforce was quite diverse and uh, but also very flexible in how they were able to to work and then opportunities to mentor young people into positions of leadership so those are the things that i hope to uh, that i got gathered from the research that i hope to look at ways that i can further implement some of the recommendations and uh, and being able to, to to be as deliberate as we possibly can about it and also you know trying to think about the notion of certain um, uh, uh, sectors of municipal government and which is quite startling uh, when you start to think about uh, police and fire and uh, I will say for my community uh, recently, uh, due to uh, contract negotiations, we are actually moving towards coming out of civil service and actually being able to create greater flexibility for the city of Framingham to hire a, a much more diverse uh, staff and as well as being able to uh, throw a wider net, so to speak. So that, those are some things that in my couple minutes that I get a chance to introduce the panel and being able to continue our conversation, I, I want to once again say <clears throat> Thank you to uh, doc, uh, Dr. Flinge for his wonderful work. And now I will introduce our panel. Uh, uh, we have starting first and foremost is Gordon Goodwin. And Gordon is the Director of Government Alliance on Race and Equity, GARE, a program of Race Forward. Uh, we have uh, also Brandy H. M. Brooks, the Director of Strategy and Development, uh, One Square World, and uh, and uh, and my colleague and fellow uh, city leader and uh, town leader, he's the town manager of Arlington, Adam Chapdelaine, uh, and happy to have you all here. So I'm gonna give you all a couple of minutes, five minutes, roughly about five minutes to, to kind of react, respond to the research. And, uh, and I'll, we'll start with Adam. Thank you, Mayor. You, you caught me by surprise. I, I thought I was going to go third there. I wasn't ready, for, wasn't ready on the mute button. Uh, so uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Salike. Uh, thank you to the MAPC for putting this study together. Um, you know, I think, like the Mayor alluded to, I think many of us who work and manage municipal government uh, knew much of this to be the case, probably were not aware of the extent of it and how um, across the entire region just how um, lacking in diversity the municipal workforce was. So putting this report together and, and having these findings be so crystal clear, um, really more than anything will make the work of municipal managers and municipal leaders easier in doing the work that's hard but necessary, as you said, Dr. Flinge, to, to start to change this, right? This, this is, this, with this study, it's not gonna be my opinion. It's not going to be just the opinion of a few people. This is really cold, hard data that we can use to move the ball forward. I think the other thing I would say in, in listening to this, this report today is you know, we, we have started doing work in Arlington with the goal of being intentional about how we start to change things. Uh, we've had an equal opportunity advisory committee that tracks data in regards to applicants and hires along the lines of race and gender, as has been suggested. Uh, more recently, we've hired a diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator we started putting a diversity value statement on the top of all of our job descriptions as they're posted. Um, and, and, and more efforts as well. We've partnered with the Mystic Valley NAACP in trying to uh, advertise jobs that are open so that people of color uh, might be more aware, more aware of opportunities in Arlington town government. But what we see is it's still a big challenge to move the needle. And I don't wanna at all uh, diminish the work that Arlington or other communities have done but in the light of what's been presented today, it feels like tinkering when we need an overhaul. And I think that, again, this report and this data helps to give us that impetus, that motivation uh, to, to begin that overhaul and to think about how can we really start to be intentional about the culture that we create in our workforce, about the inclusivity in our, in our organization that we can recreate. And then how, once we've done that, or at the same time, how can we start to recruit retain and promote people of color, uh, people, of, uh, people of all genders and, and varied backgrounds. Uh, because I think as the report shows, we, we do better, we're more productive. And I think research even outside of this report has shown that a diverse team is usually a more productive, more innovative team uh, 
Uh, so this isn't just doing something for the, you know, for moral reasons. It's, it's good for productivity reasons and efficiency reasons and, and reasons of innovation. We can make our organizations more successful if we start to meet these goals of diversifying our workforce. Um, I will say I, I left out, uh, Arlington has also joined GARE, so I'm, I'm interested in hearing from, uh, from Gordon today as well. But with that, I'll wrap up my comments. I, I'm very, very thankful uh, to have been included today and for this work that's done, and I'm now more excited than I was coming in to continue doing this work and really ramping up our efforts in Arlington. So thank you. Thank you, Adam, appreciate that. And we're gonna go to uh, uh, Brandy Brooks here, now. Uh, Brandy H. M. Brooks, <laughs> making sure we get the right Brandy. Yes, hi everyone, thank you. It's a pleasure to be on this call. And thank you so much, Dr. Flingai and the team uh, for putting this report together. And, you know, I think that I wanna pick up on something that Adam just said, which is that there are some really great nuances in the data of this report about how this is playing out specifically in municipalities in Massachusetts. And everyone on this call knew the basics of this report already. And I think we have to contend with that seriously and not gloss over that point. There have been studies and research that have pointed over and over again to racial and sex and gender related and age related issues in hiring. We've had those studies. Maybe they didn't specifically talk about the 164 towns in Metro Boston, but that is not the reason why we're not acting on this. We have to ask ourselves, we have known that this is an issue for years and decades. So why weren't cities and towns collecting this data already? Why is it that we're still having to have a basic equity discussion? Why is it that we're still having to justify a basic equity discussion? that we actually can't simply say it is the correct thing to do for us to treat other people equitably and with dignity. We actually have to look at the root causes behind that because look, we have had anti-discrimination laws on the books for quite some time. People have been going through diversity training for longer than I've been alive. We don't lack the data, we don't lack the knowledge, what we lack is the will and we have to ask why. And the answer is that we have been trained and conditioned to be agents of structural oppression and we don't wanna deal with that fact. We don't wanna deal with the way that we have been trained to replicate these patterns, to make judgments, to have to justify the value of other people's lives. We don't want to discuss why a phrase like Black Lives Matter is so controversial. That shouldn't be a statement that requires any further discussion. The only reason why it is so controversial is that deep down folks understand that there is a way our entire system is built on Black lives not mattering and on them being disposable and exploitable in every possible way. And in order to get to the roots of that training, we have to do some deep work on what are the attitudes and beliefs, what are the cultures and the practices that have grown rooted in a culture that fundamentally says certain people in our communities are not valued, both don't have to be listened to, shouldn't be hired, shouldn't be treated with respect. And that means for each of us to do some deep and seriously accountable, honest, vulnerable, and difficult work about how we are showing up in this system. And in my experience as an equity trainer and consultant, this is the most difficult thing and the thing that people have the hardest time with, is acknowledging that there's a dominant culture that we are trained to play into. Acknowledging that regardless of our intent, that we are acting out structural oppression every single day acknowledging that regardless of our stated values, we are violating them in a whole bunch of ways that structures are built and that it literally requires us to unpack all of that learning, to understand the trauma of being set up as agents for structural oppression and why we resist even acknowledging that that's the case, to do healing around that trauma, and then to really dig into what it looks like to bring transformation. 
there are times when I read Dr. King's book, for the, the, the book called Where Do We Go From Here? was like the last book that he wrote in 1968, or it was published in 68 before he was murdered. And there are sections of that book that are like reading the news in 2020. We have to ask ourselves why we're still having a basic equity as an issue in municipal hiring conversation in 2020. If we don't right now do the deep work, to move way beyond that conversation, to get at the roots of what drives us and be real honest with ourselves about the uncomfortable parts of this, we are going to be waiting another 50 years and our kids and our grandkids are still going to be having this conversation. And honestly, I don't think the planet's going to give us that long because we are in the middle of massive environmental, political, social, healthcare, all economic, all the crises. We have got to decide right now that we know that our humanity and our dignity can only be claimed, reclaimed through a vigorous fight for other people's humanity and dignity, and that we're going to make the choice to do that today. Because you have everything that you need to do it today. It's just a question of whether or not we will. Mm-hmm. Well said, Brandy. Well said. And, you know, in the intersection um, of what I look at is the intersection of pandemic, economic downturn, and issues around race. This is the trifecta of, of, of issues that we've been, we individually, we've experienced them, but collectively, it's challenging. And we, and, and as Brandy so eloquently stated, we have an opportunity to deal with it. So we're going to wrap up with Gordon and with his five minutes, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So please do put your questions into the chat box. The team is going to help me monitor the questions. So head to you, Gordon. Thank you very much, Mayor Spicer. It's uh, great to be with all of you today. Dr. Flinge, thank you so much for this excellent research. A couple of reflections um, on the research and uh, just on, on some of the previous comments. Clearly, one of the things that this demonstrates, and you can see in the chat box, is the power of having some data. Yeah. And I think it needs to just be called out that um, the research that was done, in large part, had to be done using other types of primary source data not necessarily data that was coming directly from governments. And so some of the questions that you all have about how we begin to actually start collecting this data, you know, if we don't have the data, then we're not able to actually demonstrate where we're seeing some significant disparities in terms of hiring and advancement, in terms of how people are receiving government services and having a very different experience based on their race. So if there's one thing that I hope you do as a result of this research is to really not only collect the data, but be able to have that data be disaggregated by race, by gender, language spoken at home, by zip code, all of these factors that we know are predictive of how well you're gonna do in our society. But the second thing is this, is that in terms of the political will, Um, It's great that we're having this conversation because prior to March, anybody who was saying that someone who worked in a grocery store, someone who was attending to our older people who are in retirement facilities um, was an essential worker, simply wasn't thought to be the case, right? Um, Child care workers, we're coming into a phase right now where we want to Uh, ensure that every business has what it needs to survive. Home-based child care workers, you know, largely people of color, not receiving some of those PPE loans. They don't qualify for this. It's a highly regulated business. It's one that's absolutely essential for getting everybody back to work, something that seems to be missing from our conversation. There are things that we do every day in governments practices largely, thank you very much, Brandy, for mentioning that, that actually contribute to racialized outcomes. One of the things that came up today is the use of the civil service ranking uh, around uh, assigning additional points to veterans. Now, let's talk about that for just a second. Makes absolute sense, sense that we definitely want to provide some recognition for 
how people have served our country. But when you start taking a look at the outcomes, if that's actually serving as a barrier to people of color being considered for positions, how do we then begin to acknowledge that it's a barrier and change that practice? Um, this is really what the work of racial equity is about. When we talk about diversity, you know, is it important that we have a workforce that fully reflects all of the racial diversity in our communities? It is, but it is not in and of itself sufficient to drive some of the changes that are needed so that we actually have better health, better well-being in all of our communities, and uh, an economy that's operating for all of us. In order for that to happen, we've got to start taking a look at those practices. So we talk about employment. Um, GARE works with over 100 jurisdictions a year. We have over 200 member, uh, members in our network. Some of the things that we've learned over the years are that some of the hiring practices we have are absolutely the first test, right? So many people uh, don't know that, you know, if you're applying on a government platform, every screen has to be filled out. You can't just upload your resume and say, see attached resume. When talking with people, some of you are shaking your head. I'm not going to mention the name of the platform that does that, but it weeds out a lot of people from the very beginning. We talk about civil service exams and talk about firefighter exams. I think it's appropriate we're talking about firefighters because only recently, in 2014, did the city of New York actually settle a suit brought by firefighters of color. So I think a 75 uh, question exam, which had absolutely nothing at all to do with your qualifications for a firefighter, could not be demonstrated that it actually was something that ensured that you were going to be a good employee. And the city of New York lost a lawsuit based on that. It was a practice that was used. It's been used widely across the country. It's typically thought to be something that creates some efficiencies for hiring. It was actually proven to be a barrier. How many barriers do we have? How much root cause analysis are we doing with this data uh, to begin to understand what are some of the things that are really getting in the way of people being successful? And the last point I'll leave you with is this. Kinship ties are important. And in a lot of our systems and structures, the reasons that they remain extremely white is because when we do our hiring, we're looking at kinship ties. Where did they graduate from school? Um, was it somebody that was referred by somebody who's already working here? All of these things begin to build the momentum for why our systems and structures remain overwhelmingly white, particularly at the management level. So when we start thinking about how to interrupt that, I mean, there are some things that we can do with different mentorships, but when we talk to Black employees who have been working uh, and trying to seek advancement, it's not apparent what the pathway for advancement is. Simply not apparent to significant portions of our workforce. And it's something that is a problem that could be addressed if we had the will to do that. Um, it's not always apparent um, what types of education is necessary for a particular position. Um, it's not always clear you know, where it is that you go next so that you can get that management position. And a lot of that comes down through informal networks. So making that more apparent, the invisible visible in our systems and structures is one of the things that we can definitely do. And I'm gonna just stop my comments there. Okay, great, thank you, thank you so much. And I, um, as we start, I see people putting questions into the chat and I'm gonna go to uh, CB. CB had a question and see if uh, still with us. Oh uh, yeah, still here. Thank you so much for, for calling on me. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if, given the, uh, the kind of the discussed 
shortcomings of diversity efforts alone or in a silo. I'm wondering if there's any research on uh, efforts to, in the past, to diversify uh, police forces in particular, and whether or not there is any positive impact or uh, negative impact, as it were, on rates of uh, police violence, especially against uh, people of color. And is that question for a particular panelist? Anybody want to tackle it? We'll just jump in. Yeah, I, I can take that question. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, we speak about this in the report in a bit of detail, but um, especially in this moment, uh, in the last number of years, there has been a number of reforms being placed or being suggested for police departments. And one of the ones that in the mainstream uh, has taken on some level of like continual resurgence over the years, over the decades has been maybe if we diversify police forces, then they will stop and like having discriminatory policies and, and using, using police brutality disproportionately, disproportionately on uh, black and brown uh, citizens and residents. And, and the research doesn't show that diversification has any impact on this. By and large, the, 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 the data is very, very inconsistent and suggests that there's not much of an impact, that diversification by and large doesn't change the institutional culture of police departments and, and police work. And so this is not necessarily surprising given the history of policing. It started as a way to either protect property or to catch slaves in the uh, antebellum, or, uh, yeah, antebellum South. And so uh, its lineage is of a particular history that uh, it hasn't shed um, in modern in, uh, incarnations of it. And so because of that, the institutional culture and the manifestations of that may slightly change, um, but, and it may slightly change with increases in people of color, increases in women officers, but the research suggests that that may actually not be the case, that there may not be uh, much change at all. And so when it comes to thinking about how we look at police forces, um, diversification simply is not borne out in the data as a way to make any structural change. And I think the calls that are happening right now in the streets is not so much to think about things like diversification and even like the kind of surface level reforms that we talked about in the past, but something greater, some structural transformation again, which um, again, as Brandy said, is hard work and requires an actual honest reckoning with what purpose um, and what ethos and culture exists in a range of our government uh, 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 occupations, but particularly with, with policing. I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. You know, the only thing I'll add to that is that there has been a lot that has been researched about the culture of policing. And I think that in terms of accountabilities, we're talking about, you know, a couple of different problems here. Number one is, you know, recruiting for policing is down significantly in the country over the past three years. Um, and I think that's in part due to the fact that it's been in the spotlight quite a bit. Uh, but the other piece is this, is that just like with firefighting, a lot of times policing is a career pathway that's almost sort of like in the family, right? In the family, it's passed from largely, you know, fa father to son, uh, sometimes mother to daughter, but that has a tendency to uh, perpetuate itself in terms of, let's just think about this for a minute, merit, right? Anytime we have merit as part of uh, a consideration for employment, um, sometimes this comes about because somebody had some experience as an MP in the military, but other times it comes about because we know you. Uh, merit is largely in the eye of the beholder and significantly in a lot of uh, uh, recruiting and just training for policing. That still plays a factor. We've interrupted it from time to time with different programs, um, but I think that there is um, something to be looked at in terms of how we are beginning to think about different backgrounds, different career pathways, and um, different levels of accountability for how we do policing in general, and really rethinking what public safety is. Uh, significantly, because I think we use 9-1, 
911 in ways that are not always helpful uh, for every emergency. That's one place to interrupt. Anytime you hear about the walking while black, barbecuing while black, you know, selling water while black issues, 911 could interrupt that, but also just having a broader sense of what public safety can be and having broader response, which is I think at the, the heart of the conversation we're at right now. Thank you. We're gonna go to uh, Tanya, uh, excuse me, Lisa first, uh, Lisa only, and then we'll go to Tanya. I, I see you, Tanya, too. I, so Lisa first. Hi, um, so thank you so much. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Flinge. I, I um, was wondering if you could speak a little more about your findings uh, regarding diversity in the educational sector and any recommendations particular to that area. It just feels so important to uh, start addressing this problem where it starts, which is in our schools and with our students. So wondering if you could speak to that. All right, thank you for that question. Um, so in terms of the data that we, we have, um, we saw two primary findings. One, that uh, the education occupation workforce throughout the region is, again, overrepresented with um, white employees. Um, and also that it is 76% uh, female versus most other uh, municipal occupations, which are generally more male. And so, um, you know, we, we I, I'm, I'm not an expert in education research, so I won't go into too much detail aside from the data that we have, but um, I think one thing that we do have to reckon with is that for, uh, and these are public school teachers, so for a public school system that uh, teaches perhaps a, most likely a, a diverse range of students to again have a uh, predominantly white um, teacher core um, like is, is, is something that needs to be addressed uh, and you know one thing that comes to mind and it's, it's just like a, an idea and a thought is that um, so many of our schools and more diverse areas are, are poorly funded because of the way we structure educational funding um, and and those environments are perhaps harder to like just it's harder to be a teacher. Um, you have amazing teachers there, but it's also just like objectively harder to teach with fewer resources. Mm -hmm. And so um, finding, we have to just find ways to change the educational systems, funding mechanisms in order to provide more opportunities for, for teachers of color who exist in large numbers to be able to continue their great work and, and, and make sure that we address that issue. Um, but in terms of the data, those are the two main parts that uh, it's uh, more female than the rest of the municipal workforce and that it is um, more white than even the municipal workforce in general. Thank you. We're going to go to Tanya Shallop. And then uh, after Tanya, Amy is coming up. Hi, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you. It's great to see all of you. Um, my question is coming as someone from who's working in a relatively small town, which is overwhelmingly white, um, as I know quite a number of our towns around the state are um, due to many of these racist forces that we're talking about. Um, and what advice you have for those of us who are working in those towns, um, you know, the demographics make it challenging but also the idea that, oh, our workforce should reflect our community, um, which in my mind, the community is that way itself because of these racist forces. So should we per be perpetuating the idea that our workforce should look like our community? Um, so I address that to Gordon or Adam, but anyone who has thoughts on that, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. One thing I'll say is that if you know that due to the patterns of housing in your region, people of color have been excluded significantly. Um, and then, you know, I don't know how you sort of uh, not acknowledge that analysis in terms of, you know, why things are the way they are. I do, I am not saying that it is a strict rule that, you know, you have to have ro racial proportionality based only on only on um, your population. I think what you need to be able to do though is realize that you are in a region, you are part of a region 
that is grounded in a lot of commuting, um, that there are people who are working in local government who live all over that region, and that if you see that your numbers are significantly out of step with uh, other surrounding communities or with the region as a whole, that I think it is part of your stewardship responsibility to ensure that you are building for the future uh, of talent in your jurisdiction to find talent um, wherever you possibly can and to ensure. Um, I would also encourage you to take a look at your school system and find out how racially diverse it is right now. It's probably a bellwether for what you're going to be in 20 years, but ensure that you are part of the opportunity uh, for the economy and for your community. So that's, it's, it's gonna be difficult, I think, because there may be a reputation that your town has in terms of, well, you know, we've actually kept people out aggressively, maybe not just with real estate, but with policing. Um, but I, I do uh, think that it is part of your stewardship responsibility as a member of the region uh, to ensure that you have uh, racial representation across the board in, in your jurisdiction. Thank you. Adam, go ahead. You, now I want to hear you weigh in too. So I would say we all, in, in these predominantly white suburban communities, we need to find a way to educate both our elected leadership and our appointed leadership on these issues. Um, we were fortunate in Arlington, uh, you know, so, somewhat of a bigger town, a little bit more budgetary capability. We've started working with the National League of Cities Race, Equity, and Leadership Division, which provides training to municipalities based on GARE's curriculum. And we provided that both to our select board uh, in a half day session and then to 65 uh, supervisory and leadership staff across the town and a whole day training. We're supposed to be doing a five part training. Unfortunately, like so many things, uh, the pandemic has pushed that off. Uh, we want this all to culminate with each department doing work with a racial equity toolkit to be able to find instances of institutional and systemic racism department by department and eradicate them. But what I will say is very otherwise seemingly well-intentioned white people might not know this history. They, they need to hear what Brandy said earlier. And there's no excuse that they don't know it, um, but a lot of them don't know it. And they need to hear and learn and understand why things aren't the way they are by accident. Things are the way they are for a reason. Uh, whether you go back to the 1800s or into much more recent history, uh, there have been very intentional things done by governments to have the world look the way it looks today. And once, not, not everybody changes their mind, but once people start, uh, in my experience, once people start to learn about this and understand why things are the way they are, they're more likely to become advocates for change. So, um, you know, uh, Tanya, I don't know what community you're from, um, and, and getting the National League of Cities in to train every community is just not going to be capable, uh, not, not, not practical, but um, finding some way to bring that education to your elected leadership and appointed leadership, I think would be a great start to shift in the conversation. Thank you, Adam. I'm gonna, uh, I, I know there's always, this is a discussion that we could have all morning long and I know time is, a, is, is running short, but I wanna get to at least a couple more questions. Um, uh, Amy, we're gonna go to Amy Shin. Hi, um, first of all, thank you so much for holding this space and to all the panelists for all the work that's been put in. Um, I'm an undergraduate student doing some research on diversity in green jobs and in particular like wastewater management quality in um, municipal jobs. Um, and it just seems like a lot of these conversations are about having more conversations, which is really important. And I think for especially the mostly white male management leadership, um, it's really important. And like for some people, it's it might be the first time that they're having these conversations, but what are some concrete steps and like programs that have been um, done in the past or in other systems that are catered more to young, the young people of color that we're trying to recruit into the workforce? Yeah, let's see, who would like to start in on that question? So I, I'd like to start. Uh, Brandy. Go ahead, Brandy. <laughs> Great. Um, so, Amy, thank you for your question. I know 
um, this is, you know, having those pathways defined is really important for, for young folks trying to come into uh, these fields. And I think it's important, like there are, a lot, there are places that have these existing programs, but I also want to reiterate something that was said in the Angela Davis quote at the start of the presentation, which is that you can have all of the recruitment and mentoring programs for these organizations that you want. They proliferate in many cases. But the intervention isn't actually that we need to help younger people of color do better within a racist and misogynist and ageist system. The reason that they're struggling and not getting hired isn't because they're not doing it right. It's because the older, whiter male folks who are hiring them and who are creating culture are need an intervention. <laughs> And again, I think we really resist that. And we want to, there's a, there's a, the Racial Equity Institute uses this analogy that says if you constantly saw fish in a pond coming up dead at the top of the pond, well, if you saw one fish, you might be like, oh, something happened to that fish. If you saw a hundred fish, you're not just going to be like, oh, something's attacking a hundred individual fish. You would think that there's something wrong with the pond. You would think even broadly that there's something wrong with the groundwater that's feeding into that pond. We keep doing fish interventions for lake and groundwater problems. And if we are not fixing the lake and the groundwater, then we are continuing to invite younger people, people of color, women and folks, uh, you know, non-binary and gender non-conforming folks into structures that will chew them up and spit them out. And every time I train at white dominant organizations, that's the experience that people are having, where they're struggling to try and hang on in an organization where fundamentally their experiences are not reflected and respected. And I think there's a lot of times when we want to skip to, like, what's the program? What's the policy so we can fix it? That is also a dominant culture mentality that says, like, give me the quick fix so that this can be over. This has been four to 500 years of building this infrastructure. It's, it's not going to be over with a mentoring program. And again, we've got to be willing to do that much longer, much deeper personal and vulnerable work, especially with management leaders, especially with folks from privileged identities. Thank you so much. You know, this, this is such a powerful conversation and, uh, and, 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 and so well stated, Brandy, that, um, at the end of the day, it, 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 there's a deeper root. And it's also, uh, you know, the, the, the structure of institutional racism is about how do you give up power and privilege? And how do you share that power and privilege? And when that doesn't happen in a space or at spaces and created, the dynamic will not change. And, and certainly as we all are, you know, having these discussions and seeing a lot more of this discussion, particularly as a result of George uh, Floyd's murder, we are seeing people that are activating. We're seeing people that are fearful. We're seeing people that are just, uh, just make this all go away. And, and, and we have to acknowledge all of that is going on at the same time. But at the end of the day, if we want to see change, we've got to be the change, we've got to do the work behind making it happen. So I know we have only several minutes left and I'm gonna turn it back over uh, to our wonderful host, Emily, who has been wonderful uh, to, to wrap up. And I want to once again say thank you to all of you, uh, the entire panel, and all of you that uh, took a little bit of time out of your day to spend some time with us. So I'll turn it back over to Emily. Thank you so much, Mayor. And I would like to thank the panelists and invite a closing comment. So if there's a closing comment, um, Gordon, Brandy, Adam, that you would like to leave us with, please. My closing comment is, uh, first of all, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this conversation. Uh, I think what you are hearing from all of us is that uh, there is no one magic bullet uh, for addressing these challenges that you must simultaneously work on some of the things that are foundational to your culture that are actually preventing people from fully participating uh, and being present. And you have to take a look at the practices and procedures that you use every day to drive some of the efficiencies that we think are important in government and start asking the question, 
where are those getting in the way of what our intentions are for ensuring that um, we are fully reflective in terms of our employment uh, for our community of the racial and ethnic diversity and that everyone is getting what they need to be successful in our community. Thank you. Uh, I want to share an a, a anecdote for something that uh, Justice Ginsburg said and asked um, how many women are enough on the Supreme Court, and she said none, and people were shocked at that. Um, but we don't fault the idea of an all-male or an all-white court or leader management or a bunch of other places. Um, one of the narratives that we have in doing equity work is when have we done enough? When have we met the targets so that we can stop having to, to hire folks? When have we met it so that we are done with our equity work and we don't have to do it anymore? And again, I think there's, there's a whole bunch of unpacking that we have here about this being much deeper than hitting quotas. This is about profoundly rethinking the culture and the objectives behind the work that we do in government. Things like, how do we center healing? What does it look like if we follow the leadership of people of color or young people instead of the leadership of older people um, or whiter folks? Or, or if we're following non-binary and non-conforming folks instead of male and female folks? We are really going to have to subvert every dynamic of power that we've been trained in so that we can stop asking when is enough and when can we maintain the power structure mostly but with a little spice and actually start asking how we transform. So I, I will simply say, uh, repeating Gordon and Brandy, thank you very much for this. Uh, it's so clear, like I said, there is so much work to do. And I, I, I think the point, Brandy, you were making, this is not a destination, right? This is sort of a forever a forever journey that we, we need to be on. And no better, no better time to start than now. Um, so I, I hope today can be a call to action for the other municipal leaders that are on this call. Um, I'm happy to talk with other municipal managers about work that we've been doing. We certainly don't have the solutions, but um, I think if we talk together, we can start to improve things. So again, thank you to Mayor Spicer, uh, to the MAPC, to Mark, to Gordon, to Brandy, to everyone participating today. Um, this is a, a very necessary conversation and I'm glad we had it. Great. And Saliki, Mayor, I know we have one minute left, but anything you wanted to add? Can you all hear me? Sometimes my internet comes in and out. Um, if you can hear me, I just, I just want to echo um, Randy's point. I want to thank everyone for being here, for being open to this conversation. I do want to echo Brandy's point and, and also in doing so echo Angela Davis's point that these will really require some intense um, reckonings with how we do what we do, with why we do what we do, with the incentives that we've created, with the power structures that are in place. Um, because none of these are going to have quick fixes. You can't put a bandaid on a gaping wound. And so the idea of structural transformation is key, and that involves a lot of work um, to get things better in a sustainable way. And I think we can't, we can't go past that work, and we can't act like it's going to be a quick fix. Um, that being said, I think Brandy's point again of like thinking about who has the power to restructure things uh, and create better futures, I think is something we need to think about. And the traditional power structure that is exemplified in our current government structure is, is not supportive for marginalized communities. And we need to really think about that um, and do the work to flip that script. Great. And Mayor, I just want to say thank you so much for moderating. I don't know if you have one last mo closing comment and otherwise we can thank everyone. We can thank everyone, educate, educate, educate. And the more we do of that to do self-education, we can reflect that out into our respective communities. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. This is really the start of this conversation. MAPC hopes that we can continue these conversations. We will have some follow-up events with municipal, uh, municipal leadership um, on our Metro Common project. This is our long-term uh, project, and we want to make sure to continue this, con this uh, constructive conversation. Um, and uh, we just want to say thank you. I think Mark uh, posted an opportunity for um, municipalities to also participate in an event on July 28th uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, on our Racial Equity Municipal Action Program. Uh, in terms of follow-up for today, there will be an email. We will make sure to send this report out widely. Um, and please take uh, the, the resources and this data and share it widely. And if there's any collaboration, future collaboration you would like to have with us, a future event, workshop, et cetera, please let us know. Thank you so much and have a wonderful and healthy afternoon. Bye-bye. Nice to see you all.